Welcome to Plug Life Television and a special welcome to everyone who's joined us having watched my two talks as part of Renault's EV Cafe series. I did a, a double header talk a couple of weeks ago to do with contentious materials within electric vehicle batteries, which I recently covered as part of the Watt Barrier series of Plug Life Television, and a talk that compared the carbon footprint of a brand new petrol car over building it, running it and scrapping it versus the carbon footprint of an electric vehicle. Now that one's based on one of the earliest episodes of Plug Life Television, but that was looking at the carbon footprint of a brand new EV versus a really old petrol car, coming at it from some of the naysayers who were saying, I'll just hold on to my old petrol car because that's more environmentally friendly to do than building a new car. As it turns out, if that new car is an EV, then that statement is incorrect. The EV is less carbon intensive. But what if the petrol car that we're talking about is a brand new one that supposedly is more environmentally friendly, it's got the latest petrol engine technology in it and so on, emissions reductions, etc, etc. Does that statement still hold? Is a petrol car actually cleaner over its lifespan than a brand new electric car? That's what we're going to find out today. Some people claim that over its lifetime, an electric car produces more CO2 than a petrol or diesel car, so the latter must be more environmentally friendly. But is this true? To find out, let's crunch the numbers for an average new internal combustion engine car sold in the UK in 2019 and a 62 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf electric car, over a 160,000 mile lifespan. All cars need a chassis, and the amount of energy required to make that chassis won't vary by much depending on its drivetrain. Looking at figures from the French Energy and Environment Agency and Volkswagen, a reasonable figure for the embodied energy of a car from its chassis manufacturer is 21,000 kilowatt hours. There is no mention of how much of this energy involves electricity and how much of this involves heat, for example to melt the steel. But I shall cruelly assume that it's all electricity and that that electricity comes from a gas-fired power plant. We will not use any of the excess heat from the plant to help produce the chassis. We shall use the IPCC figure for gas electricity of 490 grams of CO2 for every kilowatt hour produced which works out higher than the average emissions of most major grids in Europe, North America and East Asia. From this, the embodied carbon of chassis manufacture is found to be 10.3 tonnes. Of course, an electric vehicle has a battery pack, so let's now consider the embodied carbon of its battery manufacture. I shall base my calculations on an excellent and comprehensive study from Argonne National Laboratory, a leading academic institute for battery research. This study concludes that 900 megajoules of energy is required to manufacture one kilowatt hour of lithium ion battery. Converting this to kilowatt hours and multiplying by the 62 kilowatt hours of the battery pack found in a leaf, we find that the leaf battery pack has 15,500 kilowatt hours of embodied energy. If all of this energy involved electricity from gas, this equates to 7.6 tonnes of CO2 to produce the battery. Next we must consider emissions from the electricity used to drive the car. The UK grid is rapidly decarbonising, so 240 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour is a reasonable figure to use. The average EV has an electrical economy of 4 miles per kilowatt hour of electricity, so this equates to 60 grams of CO2 per mile driven. Therefore, for an EV driven 160,000 miles using the standard UK grid mix of electricity, the carbon emissions from driving is 9.6 tonnes. In total, the carbon footprint resulting from building the EV and the battery from gas-fired electricity, driving 160,000 miles on the UK grid mix, and scrapping the car completely unnecessarily after just 160,000 miles, since the electric motor and battery will still have plenty of life left in them, is 27.5 tonnes of CO2. Now let's consider the petrol car. An average new car sold in the UK in 2019 had tank-to-wheel CO2 emissions of 128 grams per kilometre, or 205 grams of CO2 per mile. The total CO2 emitted from the exhaust pipe over 160,000 miles of driving is therefore 32.8 tonnes. But that's not the full story. The petrol or diesel didn't just magically appear out of thin air. It has embodied carbon too. Let's consider the well-to-tank emissions of the petrol car. A gallon of petrol takes 6 kilowatt hours of energy to refine. About 2 kilowatt hours of that energy is from electricity, with the rest being heat. I shall generously assume that a gas combined heat and power plant provides all of the energy required. That is, 
that the plant produces 4 kilowatt hours of heat for every 2 kilowatt hours of electricity. It is highly unlikely that this would be the case, so more heat would need to be sourced, but we shall be kind to the petrol car and ignore this. This works out at 980 grams of embodied CO2 per gallon of fuel. Since the average new car sold in the UK in 2019 had a fuel economy of 50.5 miles per gallon, this gives us well-to-tank emissions of 3.1 tonnes of CO2 over 160,000 miles, even if we're still conveniently ignoring the carbon from extracting and shipping the oil to the refinery. So, the total carbon footprint resulting from building a petrol or diesel car, running it for 160,000 miles, refining the fuel used over that distance, and then scrapping the car, probably necessarily since the internal combustion engine will be on its last legs, is 46.2 tonnes of CO2. Therefore, an electric car saves 18.7 tonnes of CO2 versus a new internal combustion engine car. Some people at this point may protest that their petrol, diesel or hybrid car has better fuel economy than the average new car. So next I'm going to give this EV its toughest competition. The Mark 1 Honda Insight a diminutive, two-seater space capsule of a hybrid that does 70 miles per gallon at 70 miles per hour without even trying, and to this day is the most fuel-efficient car without a plug on it. It is unfair to pit a five-seater family electric car against this completely different class of vehicle, but I'm doing it anyway. Recalculating based on a fuel economy of 70 miles per gallon and exhaust emissions of 160 grams of CO2 per mile, we see that the Insight produces 25.6 tonnes of CO2 from driving 160,000 miles and has a further 2.2 tonnes of embodied carbon from the production of its petrol, resulting in a total carbon footprint of 38.1 tonnes of CO2 over a 160,000 mile lifespan. So, a five-seater family electric car still saves 10.6 tonnes of CO2 versus an ultra-lightweight, ultra-efficient two-seater hybrid. Factoring in the embodied carbon of the petrol, the EV's total carbon footprint is less than the Insight's fuel alone. But this still isn't the full picture. Grids are getting greener. The UK grid has been almost completely coal-free since early April 2020, with Drax spoiling the record-breaking run by conducting a very brief test on its coal plant following a maintenance procedure. Scotland has been coal-free since the closure of Longanet Power Station in 2016. Additionally, EV and battery factories are getting greener with many now sourcing most or all of their electricity from low-carbon and renewable sources, such as Tesla's Gigafactories and BMW's factory in Leipzig. The Nissan Leaf and its battery are built in the UK, so recalculating its carbon footprint based on the UK average grid carbon intensity of 240 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, we find that its chassis has 5 tonnes of CO2 of embodied carbon, and its battery has 3.7 tonnes of embodied carbon resulting in a total carbon footprint of 18.3 tonnes including driving on a UK grid mix. But there's yet more to this story. The Leafs factory is based in Sunderland, in the northeast of England, which is consistently one of the lowest carbon parts of the UK's national grid, largely thanks to nuclear power with some wind and biomass. An average carbon intensity of 55 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour can safely be assumed for the manufacture of both the Leaf and its battery knocking these embodied carbon figures down to 1.1 tonnes and 0.9 tonnes respectively. Being even more ambitious, what if the LEAF and its battery were to be manufactured using 100% renewable electricity, and if the car was driven purely on renewables too? According to the IPCC, solar power has an embodied carbon of 45 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. This equates to an embodied carbon of 1 tonne of CO2 for chassis manufacture, and 0.7 tonnes of CO2 for battery manufacture and just 1.8 tonnes of CO2 to drive the LEAF 160,000 miles. The total embodied carbon for a 100% renewable EV, a scenario that could already be played out today with some EV manufacturers, is just 3.5 tonnes of CO2, representing a 34.6 tonne saving versus the Mark 1 Insight, and a 42.7 tonne saving versus the average new petrol or diesel car sold in the UK in 2019. What's more, this is a worst case scenario for renewables. Wind power has 25% of the embodied carbon of solar power. On top of this, we haven't even considered NOx emissions and particulate matter from internal combustion engines, which cause severe health issues in urban areas, or fuel leakage from petrol or diesel tanks. There's also the possibility of retrofitting an internal combustion engine vehicle to electric propulsion, which saves the CO2 associated with chassis manufacture. 
Supposedly dead batteries from electric vehicles still have at least 70% of their original capacity remaining, which makes them perfect for second life applications such as grid storage, where they may stay in service for another decade or more before being fully recycled via one of many increasingly efficient techniques. You can only burn petrol or diesel once. So even if EVs and their batteries are manufactured in a country with a carbon intensive grid, they still save tens of tons of CO2 over their lifetime versus a brand new petrol car or the most efficient hybrids on the road. With grids and factories getting greener, those carbon savings are starting to skyrocket, with the potential for an electric vehicle's carbon footprint to shrink by 95% or more versus a new petrol car today. Those same carbon saving tricks simply cannot be replicated by petrol or diesel cars. A final point worth noting. Not only will the electric vehicle easily save hundreds if not thousands of pounds in maintenance over that lifespan, but based on a petrol cost of £1.20 per litre and an electricity cost of 15 pence per kilowatt hour, the EV will save over £11,000 in fuel. Imagine how much more you would save with an off-peak electricity tariff, solar panels, or a dynamic tariff that sometimes pays you to charge your car at night. Anyone who's been looking at trends in grid carbon reduction around the world and trends in battery technology and recycling capability will not have found these results in the least bit surprising. But those people tend to be experts within those sectors. It's not the everyday person on the street. So to them, these results are a revelation, as I found out when I presented that talk at the EV Cafe. So hopefully this video will be a useful reference the next time a friend or, or colleague of yours has any concerns about the impact of an electric vehicle's battery on the EV's green credentials. So, as we've just found out, the embodied energy of an electric vehicle does not necessarily translate to its embodied carbon. You can actually build EVs and run them very greenly. You simply cannot do that with a petrol car. You are going to be continuing to produce not just CO2, but NOx and particulate matter emissions and so on. It's very, it's very environmentally damaging to run an internal combustion engine vehicle, but EVs can and already are run very cleanly. Um, that said, we shouldn't use this video as an excuse to let some of the more polluting factories off the hook. So there are a number of cell factories that are being built in Poland, for example, which does have a very coal-intensive grid. They are starting to increase the percentage of wind power that's used but um, nonetheless, at the moment, there's still a heavy emphasis on coal. So even although the figures still work out that the EV will be cleaner over its lifespan than a brand new petrol or diesel car, why should we give the EV such a heavy carbon penalty right at the beginning of its life? There are really easy ways to resolve that issue with these Polish factories, and that is simply to carpet the roof, or the vast roof space of these factories, with solar panels. Um, because there's plenty of space that's otherwise not being used. And um, also, if there's space nearby, put in some wind turbines. You're basically copying what Tesla have done with the Gigafactory in Nevada. Um, if there's a river nearby, try installing hydro. You can make a renewable energy island, even in a sea of dirty fossil fuels. And by using on-site renewable energy, which is about as efficient as you can get, minimal transmission losses, etc., you have really reduced the embodied carbon of the battery pack, which is then sent off to wherever the electric vehicle factory is to be installed. So that just makes so much sense, and I would encourage every manufacturer out there. In fact, do you know what? Any heavy industry, it doesn't just need to be batteries. It could be anything that requires a lot of energy. If you've got massive roof space, just stick solar panels on there. If you've got room for wind turbines, put some wind turbines in. Reduce the embodied carbon of your products right from the off, and that makes them so much greener. Well, hope that's been of interest. I'll see you again soon for another episode of Plug Life Television.